civil resistance and have studied the dynamics of nonviolent civic mobilization. And obviously in my pre-State Department work, and even when I was working in the State Department, I was working with activists who were involved in nonviolent campaigns and movements from around the world, um, mainly in the Middle East, but really from all different parts. And these were activists who were uh, involved in resistance against some very difficult, formidable opponents. And so a lot of the inspiration for the academic research that I did was based on really the inspiration of working with these activists who maintained their nonviolent work and discipline despite really, really tough um, situations. And so what I thought I would do today and really would love to keep it as interactive as, as possible, and if you have particular areas of interest um, you know, feel free to ask even as I'm presenting um, if you have particular questions. But I'll talk a little bit about this, um, you know, sort of the research um, that's the basis of the book, Why Civil Resistance Works. So why we found Erica Chenoweth and I that nonviolent campaigns have a, a success rate um, that's twice as effective as armed campaigns against the same kind of opponents. And then um, talk a little bit about the gender angle, which really is not, I was saying, it's not something I've really focused on ever from an academic perspective. So I only began to do sort of a crash course in reading in the lead up to this, to this talk, and obviously um, had Carol's book and began to read some of the chapters. And it has you know, inspired me to, to think um, you know, differently about framing and about certainly why women and women's roles in these campaigns and movements can be unique, advantageous, but also obviously how women can play a role in armed, you know, movements and insurrections. Because um, the book sort of shatters the, the myth that women are naturally more peaceful and so blah, blah, blah. So women play roles in the full spectrum. But I think what they do and how they're able to create space in nonviolent organizing is really important. And so just, you know, thinking about uh, the talk today has got me thinking about this phenomenon a little bit differently. So anyway, so as Carol mentioned, we, um, Erica Chenoweth and I wanted to look systematically at violent and nonviolent campaigns. So we helped, uh, or we put together a data set that looked at 323 campaigns from 1900 to 2006 um, that were focused on very specific um, types of struggles. Three categories, campaigns against dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, campaigns against foreign occupations, and campaigns for territorial self-determination. And we chose these campaigns because they're considered the hard ones. If nonviolent resistance can succeed against tough dictatorships, it can succeed anywhere. And no one believes that nonviolent resistance can succeed against these different types of opponents. So we lined them up and we held constant regime type and GDP and all these variables that you, know, you would think would influence whether or not one um, type of struggle succeeds over the other. And we found that nonviolent campaigns succeeded 53% of the time compared to 27 for violent. So twice as effective as um, violent resistance against the same formidable opponents. And so for many people, that finding was counterintuitive and sort of challenged the conventional wisdom about really what is the most effective type of struggle, even against opponents that are willing and often do use, use violence against the opposition or against the activists. And so, so then the book essentially um, goes through and lays out why. Uh, so this is just a chart that, again, looks at the percentages of um, success and failure for violent and nonviolent resistance. Um, this next one shows that what is interesting is that the success rate of nonviolent resistance is increasing over time. And, and so that's sort of a unique finding. The data has been updated since 2006, but um, my co-author Erica wants to publish that somewhere. So I won't, I'll let that be sort of an anticipation for you to see you know, what happened from 2006 until the present. But I can tell you, so the, the secret is that the relative effectiveness of nonviolent to violent has increased significantly since 2006, the relative effectiveness. And so anyway, so then we ask the question, obviously, of, you know, why does civil resistance succeed? Um, what gives it the comparative advantage? And we really focus in the book on the primacy of participation. So a lot more people 
are able to participate in nonviolent campaigns and movements compared to armed struggles for various re reasons. Um, but generally speaking, the moral barriers to participation, the physical barriers to participation, the informational barriers to participation, all of these are much lower for nonviolent. So, and when we're talking about nonviolent resistance, what are we talking about? This is a form of struggle. It's very proactive. It's very, um, it can be sometimes disruptive and confrontational, but it involves nonviolent tactics ranging from protests and acts of persuasion to non cooperation, boycotts, strikes, civil disobedience, vigils, sit ins, satire, mock I mean, the full range of tactics. And so the thing with civil resistance is men, women, young, old, rich, poor, workers, professionals can engage in nonviolent resistance far more easily than in violent struggle, which A, you have to be morally inclined to be willing to use violence. You have to be trained in certain, you know, how to build explosives and how to do guerrilla tactics and all this kind of stuff. And so the training requirements, the risks are far greater. And so for nonviolent resistance, you can sort of be a casual rebel. You can join and engage in consumer boycotts or, you know, you can perform work sloppily at the workplace just to show dissent and disobedience. And it doesn't require always a massive investment in time. Of course, there's always core activists who give up their lives 24-7 to be activists and out in the streets. But, like, the ordinary person doesn't have to do that for nonviolent resistance necessarily. So anyway, so, so for various reasons, it's easier to participate. And... The diversity of participation is always greater in nonviolent compared to violent. And that's very important because numbers matter, but also having people from across the society who are workers, professionals, you know, uh, students, women is very important in determining success and failure. So, diversity. Because so many different nonviolent tactics exist, far more than an armed struggle, lots of people can do low risk tactics, high risk tactics to be part of a campaign or movement. And when you have lots of people who are engaged in civil, disobedi uh, civil disobedience, dissent, non cooperation, this puts huge pressure on the adversary, whether it's a government, whether it's a foreign occupation. So the participation translates into significant power. And also, I put this slide up because what's interesting, one of the key findings of the book is that nonviolent resistance compared to armed resistance it's, is much more likely to prompt defections in the security forces. So it's a lot harder um, for security forces to shoot at peaceful protesters or use mass repression and get away with it over time than it is for them to get, get away with using violence against armed insurgents who are throwing Molotov cocktails or shooting at them. It's very difficult to co-op people who are trying to kill you. So this is, this is one of the key findings with, with nonviolent resistance. So in terms of security force defections, when we think about Egypt, for example, and why sometimes security forces don't shoot at crowds, people often assume it's because certain security forces are more moral than others. Morality may have part of it, but a lot has to do with what the opposition movements themselves do or don't do vis-a-vis -vis the security forces. So backlash is more likely to occur when regime or other forces use violence against nonviolent protesters compared to violent. Um, the level of participation is much greater. The tactical diversification is much wider, which, which contributes to success. So all these things help to explain sort of the strategic advantage of nonviolent compared to armed. And then, so what's important in the book, too, is that we, um, we don't just care about what gets rid of the enemy or what topples the regime or gets rid of the foreign occupation. Eric and I cared a lot about what happens afterwards. So what is the relationship between the method of struggle, violent or nonviolent, and what happens afterwards? And we found that there's a significantly strong correlation between um, transitions driven by nonviolent resistance and A, democratic consolidation, which is what you see in this slide. So nonviolent, much more likely to result in um, a spread of democracy as measured by Freedom House and other scores. And also, significantly, that transitions driven by nonviolent um, resistance are much less likely to result in societies that relapse back into civil war.
five years out. So if you care about peace building, if you care about civil peace, then you have to take an interest in what type of struggle you're using and the type of means and methods. And it sort of makes sense. If you come to power by violent means, you're often going to use the same practices to stay in power and to control people. Um, and so it makes sense why often, you know, uh, transitions that are driven by violent insurgencies go back to civil war. And the skill set involved in building a nonviolent movement and in building coalitions are often the skill sets that are important for democracy. So, you know, being able to tolerate opposing viewpoints while bringing them into the movement, um, you know, negotiation. Um, organization. All these things are very, very important for nonviolent movements and I think help explain why um, they tend to result in greater civic peace afterwards. So the gender dimension. Um, so as in violent wars, which is the focus mainly um, of the book, nonviolent wars also have an impact on women and are impacted by women. And so, of course, there's a gender dimension and the identities of women clearly change over the course of nonviolent struggles. So what is interesting, because you know, nonviolent campaigns and movements tend to promote greater participation, what this means for women's involvement is that there's, there are a lot more avenues of participation for women directly in the struggle for nonviolent resistance compared to armed. Now, women, of course, and we'll talk a little bit about it, can take up weapons. They can form armed battalions. That's always a sliver of any female population, even in campaigns like Sri Lanka or Colombia, where you have women's units. That's always going to be a very small percentage of um, the female uh, population. And also, you know, nonviolent allows women to get involved in leadership roles and in direct forms of strategizing and protest movements in ways that are often impossible for women to get involved in in armed struggles. So this is where I, you know, people say that there tends to be a power diffusion that happens over the course of nonviolent campaigns and movements because a lot of people are involved and there are more ways for people to get involved. And so women, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the Syria context, I mean, women are very well known to be strategists of nonviolent campaigns, to organize protests and boycotts and the tactics. And what women are very, tend to be very good at is sort of the sustaining of the movement. So they get the point of building a base of social support and underground schools and hospitals and, you know, Palestine victory gardens. I mean, the women sort of pioneered building parallel structures and institutions, which is considered one of the major categories of nonviolent tactics. Women are also, again, and I don't like to take a triumphalist approach to women in protest, but it's good to focus on what they may be good at, um, because that helps us think through, well, you know, in terms of strategy and in terms of how to help women in these campaigns and movements, what, what can be done. Women, when they organize, and I heard plenty of stories from Egypt, from Syria, and beyond, when women are responsible for organizing protests, especially, especially when they design the routes, they're much more apt to take security, the security situation into consideration. And their whole point is, what can we do to maximize dissent and the, the demonstration of dissent and disobedience while minimizing the risk to the participants? Because especially in a really repressive environment, when people, many people have never protested before in their lives, and the level of fear is up to here, if you start a protest movement, by bringing people out into the street and they get whacked, I mean, big time, they're not really going to be likely to re-enter the fight anytime soon. And so you really have to think through, how do you get people to be involved in a campaign or movement while minimizing you know, the risk? So women will choose routes, for example, that may not focus on confrontations with the police. Because especially at the outset, and if the police are not trained and you know they're not used to protests, they will start shooting. It's normal. Women will come up with chants and songs to diffuse tensions between security forces and protesters in a very effective way. And women in Syria did this quite effectively, I think. So these are you know, a couple of the things, I mean, in terms of how women approach um, civil disobedience that are very interesting, unique, and helpful. But of course, you know, women are involved in armed struggles. I, I've been asking about, in the Syria context, the role of women in armed groups, and I learned actually that um, in the 
um, in the north, you may have heard that there have been extremist elements that have entered Syria as the conflict has gone on. So you have like Al-Qaeda affiliates in Nusra. So Nusra Front actually has a women's battalion now, and I believe they're trained in suicide bombings. And so this is a new dimension of the Syria struggle. And so, you know, that's an extreme example. But women, of course, will provide, you know, medical support. They'll be informants. They'll communicate messages, you know, go across checkpoints. So to, in support of armed movements. But, I mean, what is clear, and I'm sure you guys, guys, I'm sure you women who study gender and conflict would know that, you know, the that women bear a fairly disproportionate impact of the negative consequences of violence and, and war. So whether it's you know losing loved ones, becoming the sole breadwinners, massive displacement, being targeted with rape. And so when things go violent, often women are gonna pay a really huge price, which again, from like the practical perspective, okay, so what can be done to prevent campaigns and movements that begin vi non-violently to stay a non-violent trajectory? It doesn't mean women will not be targeted over the course and will not face persecution repression by engaging in nonviolent protests, but you're less likely to see massive casualties in the type of suffering that you see in, in war. So Syrian women in the revolution, um, and I'll just as a chapeau, an overview of Syria, although I'm sure this group has been following the news and knows a little bit about what's happening. So. You had the start of protests in Syria in a place called Dera, which is near the Jordanian border, in March of 2011. And it was really in the spirit of the Arab Spring. So people saw, Syrians saw what was happening in Tunisia and Egypt, and there was a lot of discontent and anger at the regime for many reasons, the level of repression, human rights violations, um, the economic situation, corruption. And so what is interesting is that um, kids in Dara began to paint um, graffiti on the walls. And they, you know, inspired by Egypt, Ishab Yurid Iskut and Nizam, the people want the fall of the regime. The kids were picked up and arrested and tortured terribly in Dara. Women with men went to the Ministry of Interior office in Dara to protest and demand that their children be brought back. What happened was the security forces basically ridiculed the women. And they said, you know what? If you want more sons, we're happy to help produce them with you. And because they'll, they can replace your sons who we have. And so it was very explicit, targeting that identity of mothers. And so the reaction was the women immediately organized, launched a sit-in. People began to see what was happening and literally the protests sparked and, you know, really <coughs> took off across Syria. And as you may or may not know, because we're in such a terrible period for Syria now with a level of violence and destruction and civil war, is that the first eight or nine months of the Syrian revolution were nonviolent. This was a very popular mass uprising um, involving Syrians using lots of creative nonviolent tactics against really one of the more most brutal regimes in the Middle East and beyond. And what is not well known is that the early nonviolent structures, revolutionary structures, were founded and led by women. And so one of the most famous is the local coordination committees, the LCCs, um, which is headed by Suher, um, uh, rather Razan Zaytune, whose picture is the second one. Razan is a human rights lawyer who cut her teeth before the revolution in protesting honor killings in Syria and trying to change the family law and the laws that were discriminatory against women. And she became one of the key advocates of nonviolent resistance in organizing human rights documentation. What is sad is that about two months ago she was kidnapped inside Syria. She's one who never left, never left Syria the whole time, despite the bombings, the Scud missiles, chemical attacks, she stayed and led nonviolent organizing, but she was detained as of two months ago and her whereabouts are unknown. But she's really considered one of the heroes of the nonviolent revolution. But all, there were at least three major networks that sprouted, so really a creation of an underground government that was separate from the Assad regime, essentially, that were led by women.
From the very beginning, women were leading boycotts at the universities. So one of my closest contacts when I was out in the field was a young woman, Reem, from um, Aleppo University, who had been leading the university boycott. And she was also a radio personality, and so she was broadcasting and you know supporting um, resistance and dissent in that way. Um, the women of Daraya, so I encourage folks to Google the free women of Daraya to see what an amazing group of women, including women who've participated in workshops supported in Turkey, which is when I first met them. These women are known, were known. Daraya is, by the way, a park just outside of Damascus, Rif Dimashk, which is in the suburbs of Damascus. And they were known as the spray women because they would literally, even when, despite the repression and the violence of the regime, just the regime at that time, at the beginning of the revolution, would spray graffiti. Um, and that were basically calls to action, and they would communicate information about when the protests were happening, and that we're doing this for rule of law, because initially it was about, this is for rule of law, allow us to mobilize nonviolently, corruption. Of course, it changed in tone. But these women were just remarkable and like the most amazing organizers, I think, that I'd, and in terms of people who thought through all the implications, security and beyond, of any tactic that was chosen in any campaign, these women are remarkable, and I think they should win a Nobel Peace Prize. And so then, um, but eventually, there, there got to a point about nine months in where um, a, a free Syrian army emerged. And so what the Free Syrian Army was initially was really a group of people, many of whom were civilians and had never taken up weapons before. And their whole intent was just to protect their families and communities. There were some military defectors, so meaning they had left the Assad regime's army to go to Turkey. So they were actually defectors. But most people initially had seen family members killed or tortured by Shabiha, which is like the regime militia, by snipers, and they just felt they needed to do something in self-defense. And so what happened, though, is that eventually defensive violence, which was supposed to protect civilians, ended up not protecting civilians. And it just resulted in more regime and harsher regime violence using worse weapons. So it went from like snipers to scud missiles. And so the level of um, violence and re regime retaliation spiked considerably. Um, and then eventually, you know, the media got very, because the media always is intrigued by armed insurgents and what they're doing. And so there just became a lot of focus. And then eventually, you know, the armed, the Free Syrian Army became sort of the main um, form of, of resistance to the regime. And we are now where we are um, almost three years in. March 15th is the third anniversary of the Syrian revolution, actually, so in just a couple of days. And so, you know, while no one sees very much about the nonviolent mobilization that's happening in Syria, I can assure you that women are behind um, a lot of nonviolent organization that's still happening, but it's more to survive. So who's leading the humanitarian activities? You know, when polio broke out, you may have seen news that polio broke out in the liber in the northern um, Syria. It was women's networks that quickly dispersed the vaccines and essentially nipped it a bit, you know, nipped it in the bud fairly quickly. And so women are doing amazing things, but the sad part is that, um, you know, what, what we're seeing today in Syria. Um, and it's unclear sort of when what, what the light at the end of the tunnel is. So, I mean, challenge in, in terms of women in general, but especially in Syria's participation in, in nonviolent um, civil resistance, the social insecurity challenges. So, you know, once um, violence and armed struggle becomes prominent, women's ability to move around and their mobility becomes more restricted. Um, there's often social backlash for women assuming more political roles in struggle. So, Often I would hear from women that it was okay for them to do humanitarian assistance, but you know, if they wanted to start participating in local councils, then it was a little bit shakier, a little dicier with the family. And so there are some social um, challenges and obstacles. But really now, and especially when more extremist voices started coming into Syria from the outside, um, women are really between a rock and a hard place in the sense that they're targeted by regime forces, 
they're targeted by al-Qaeda and Nusra Front and ISIS. And so it's very hard for them to do and assert, um, you know, assume the roles that they had been able to assume earlier in the revolution. And, you know, one thing in the liberated parts of Syria, um, where there are like parallel structures, political structures, local councils, women are trying to become more involved in the local councils, but even now, you know, a couple years after these were set up, it's very hard for women to, and there are very few women on the local councils um, in any parts of, of Syria. And, you know, it's a combination of reasons, but also, but one of them is amongst Syrian women not having the confidence. And, you know, when you've lived in a dictatorship where association and deliberation and discussion debate is really not part of the political culture, to expect that women are going to quickly, and we are talking about quickly, even one year, two year, three years is a quick time period, be able to have the confidence and to, to do this kind of thing is, you know, it's, it's hard. And so I, I saw there were many women doing amazing things, but asserting themselves in some of the more political activities was a bit, was, was more difficult. And I mean, I, I actually, um, last night before coming here, um, there happens to be a Syrian woman activist, um, well known to IIS and others, um, who happens to be in DC just for a couple days. And one of the most amazing Syrian women activists. And she was saying that even at workshops and as they're working with women, maintaining morale in this very dark period is hard. Very, very hard. And so, you know, they try to come up with ways to inspire hope, to recognize the great work that women are doing. But in any environment where you have mass repression and a lot of violence, it's just, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, you know, but opportunities. So you may know that there have been peace talks that have started between the regime and the opposition. They're stalled now. But the women are trying to organize to have a voice um, in the formal peace process, what has been called Geneva II. Um, they're really trying and they're still involved in organizing and figuring out exactly what their role should be and how to insert themselves in the process. But there's potential for them, for them to play more of a role as you know successive rounds of negotiations happen. Um, track two and track three, so informal peace building, women often are good at bringing together you know sort of opposing ends of a of you know a conflict whether it's you know regime opposition whether it's bringing minorities together with majority women have been doing that locally inside Syria and I think there's a lot of room for women to do more of that um, now and this is where they could play a very important role women are beginning to negotiate local ceasefires in Syria which is actually very very interesting and in terms of the whole light at the end of the tunnel there may not be a negotiated settlement anytime soon in Syria, but if you can start to see women who are, you know, involved in shuttle diplomacy between rebel insurgents and regime forces to stop fighting to allow humanitarian access, that's huge. And if it can replicate, so the place where I've heard most where women succeeded in negotiating the local ceasefire was in Zabadani again close to um, close to Damascus and so this is actually a very positive um, a very positive sign there are also cases where women are I mean talk about courage and guts challenging um, al-Qaeda and Nusra so they're putting they're organizing protests to essentially say we are not going to accept you know what you are trying to impose socially on our communities and I remember I heard the story another workshop out in Gaziantep a woman who was maybe in her 50s from, I think she was from Tel Rafat, and illiterate, could not read or write. And this woman, back at home, was literally mobilizing women, A, to demand that the local council include women, and B, to put pressure on the al-Nusra infiltration in the community. And it's just like stories like that are just, you know, amazing, remarkable, and this is what gives anyone hope for, for the future of Syria. So maybe to close out, and then we can have a conversation. Um, as I mentioned to Carol, Phoebe, others, really there's not been any serious um, gendered analysis of this phenomenon of civil resistance. There are a lot of examples of the roles women have played, um, mini case studies of the, you know, 
the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, you know, the ladies in white in, in Cuba, um, the role that the Liberian women played to put pressure on the power holder often. I mean, sex boycott was one of the tactics that they used. But there is nothing really that's been done systematically that looks at and brings data in to show, you know, to, to offer a different perspective on women in civil resistance. So I encourage anyone who's in a position to do research to, to you know, work on this topic because you would be making a significant contribution to the field. Policy, which is more where I am, certainly with State Department and now being at USIP and the Atlantic Council, is really this question of what can external actors do with a broad range of tools whether it's small grants, whether it's trainings, you know, um, whether it's media and technology support, um, the full range, what can be done to support nonviolent activists and movements so we don't have future serious. This will not be the last time people rise up against um, bad governments or regimes. I mean, it's happening all around the world. This is one, like, thing, the reason why this is sort of a growth industry, civil resistance, is that people power will continue to rock our world because people are learning from each other, movements are learning, people are seeing what is possible. That's why I think there's a significant uptick in the number of nonviolent movements even since 2006 because it's caught on that this may be actually an effective form of resistance. But I mean, what we haven't necessarily always figured out from both a governmental and a non-governmental perspective is how do we most effectively support the nonviolent campaigns and movements? So it's something I'll be thinking a lot about in my work now. And then, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, what can be done to really enhance women's roles and support women's voices in nonviolent campaigns and movements? And what can be done, as Carol said, to challenge this discourse of um, violence being necessary and more effective? even in really hard environments, because women in families and in you know, religious institutions, social, political, have a lot of influence over people. So they can you know, help change this type of discourse. And then of course, I mean, from a gender perspective, you know, it doesn't work unless men buy into it too. So how do you get men involved in recognizing the important work of women, not as victims or always as just humanitarian aid providers, but how do they see the important role that women play in organizing, mobilizing for civil resistance, and then participating in political processes and peace processes. So with that, maybe I'll leave it to discussion. And my question is about how we link sort of the local level mobilization that's happening and specifically in Syria, but it, you know, if you want to talk about other um, countries as well, um, I would be interested in that. How we link that local level mobilization to kind of, you know, in the case of Syria, the Geneva Two Talks or other national, international level negotiations that presumably will be, you know, the path towards actually having some sort of transition. Um, you know, not discounting at all the local level mobilization because I'm completely with you that it's really some of the most incredible that I've ever seen going on, what women are doing in Syria right now. Um, but I, I think we're seeing that they're not, you know, those voices for various reasons that you laid out are not being heard so much in these larger discussions. And mm -hmm. Do you think it's necessary for that linkage to happen and how would you suggest going about making it happen? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Even just from a civil resistance, a strategic civil resistance perspective, how you go from local contestation and local protest to forming sort of a national movement. And um, so I can say, in, in the Syria context, that was always going to be very, very difficult for many reasons. And, you know, the sort of the sect divides and the ethnic divides is only sort of one part of it. Um, but also you know, the level of mistrust amongst Syrians and amongst anyone in repress who have lived in a repressive environment is often so profound that forming coalitions beyond your family is often an extremely difficult thing to do. So, I mean, I've heard enough stories from, you know, um, women, not in, only in Syria, but who've lived in various dictatorships who report on not even knowing if their family members are, you know, with the Muhabarat or with the spy apparatus, um, are they reporting on, on us? So this happens and had been happening in Syria for so long 
that idea of coming together and organizing anything involving people, you know, from the next town over, where the assumption is that they're Mohabharat, is so hard that, you know, it's a time thing. So the first answer is, this is not going to happen overnight for these, like, local protest activities to coalesce into anything. I think... You know, if the leaders of effective local mobilization can be brought together somehow, and it's hard to do in an environment like Syria, but if they can at least meet each other virtually, you know, you know, the backbone of the Syrian revolution is Skype, of course. So this is everybody. I didn't even I didn't use Skype until the Syrian revolution. Then I got on. It's like Facebook. I didn't want anything to do with it. And then Egypt revolution happened, and I had to get on Facebook. So I suppose Twitter is my next uh, adventure. But um, so anything like virtually and sort of in training that could be used to, to bring together. But, you know, I think the, the women have themselves to be able to articulate, you know, a clear plan of action. And they can't wait for whether it's UN women or whoever is helping them come together, set the marching orders. They have to dictate them, really, because then they'll be taken more seriously. And we just haven't gotten to the point, I think, and it really, it takes time and trust building and all the things you know are important for the women to feel comfortable enough and confident enough to have a strategy for how they're going to get involved in the, in the formal negotiations. But I think also being able to document and demonstrate local successes to be able to show, here's what women have done in Zabadani and this place, this place, and really you're leaving us out of Geneva talks when we're the ones negotiating ceasefires, really? You know, so if you can like collect and, and really um, amplify those nuggets, those anecdotes, I think that also helps, you know, helps the case. Um, I think it helps showing different models of like what happened in Guatemala and other places, but then it's like the next step. So, okay, I kind of get Guatemala and I kind of understand what the Colombian women did and blah, but then it's like, okay, operationally, what does that mean? So what's the next step? And I think we're just, we're not there yet, um, you know, with, with, with Syria. Um, but, you know, in terms of writ large, so the bigger question of, you know, how you go from local to national, so what other campaigns and movements have done, so in places like Serbia and others, is they literally, the movement that began with 10 students in Belgrade cafes, set up branches of that organization in every province in Serbia. And so there was an Otpor, that was the name like resistance, there was an Otpor branch in every province. And Otpor was very smart in that they designated as spokespeople minorities who the regime, Milosevic at that time, had been saying, oh my God, if, if I go, the minorities will be targeted, persecuted. So Otpor, as the opposition, appointed minorities to lead their efforts out there. So they became the face of the opposition, the resistance. Um, this was a story that often resonated with Syrians because they knew they needed to get more minorities in the face of the opposition and the resistance. And so if there were any way, and I don't know what form it will take, for some group just to begin to establish a presence in different parts of the country so that there's a network, and whether it's a women's collective, whether it's a civil society organization, just to be able to create some strategic sinews across the country, that would be helpful, I think. Um, but it's time, confidence, success stories, being able to articulate a vision and for how this conflict ends, and being confident enough in what the women are doing and, mob and the mobilization they're doing to force Brahimi and to force Unifem and to force all these people to be like, uh, duh, of course we need to involve women. <laughs> yeah. And Maria, one of the things that you said that really piqued my interest was that um, if a nonviolent campaign had toppled the government and took over or made a transition, um, those new governments were more likely to be more democratic and be less prone to relapsing and going through another, another civil conflict. Um, and I'm wondering if those governments that were transformed by a nonviolent campaign, if the government also showed um, more women-friendly laws or allowed for more leadership of women in the new government. 
Yeah, so that's a great question, and I have no data. <laughs> so I can't, um, I can't wing it here, because I actually don't want to say something that's not backed by empirical evidence. And I, I told Carol that I wrote to Erica Chenoweth, who actually is the data guru behind this project. I'm like, Erica, do we, like, what do we say about gender in our data set? What do we say about women's roles? She's like, not, not so much, actually. So shame on us for not getting it right, you know, the first time around. So I, I wouldn't be able to say my inclination would be, you know, the greater, the, the more visible the role that women played, you know, in the re resistance and in the transition, the more likely they would have a voice in, you know, sort of government. But I don't believe, so a problem often is that after the revolution, you know, there's a lot of social pressure for women to go back and go home and, you know, do what women are supposed to do, of course. Um, and so, I, again, I think it's probably a mixed picture and it's ambivalent, but I, I mean, I can think anecdotally of cases where, you know, women have then asserted themselves in, you know, the new government, but other places, Egypt and elsewhere, where th they really didn't, which is why, I mean, um, what's interesting in the, in the MENA region, in the Middle East and North Africa, women play, have played such an important role in all the nonviolent uprisings acro across the region, um, and even in the armed ones, Libya and elsewhere. But like now, women realize that they're being marginalized and alienated, and like they don't have a political voice. And so people are talking about a women's intifada in the MENA, so a women's uprising, not focused on toppling the regimes anymore, but it's like advancing women's rights. And so we'll see, you know, what comes of that. But but anyway, but that's a perfect avenue of research, which I welcome anyone in this room to undertake. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jane Carhart. I teach in the PhD program on global governance and human security right. and write on gender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is fascinating stuff. You could obviously go on for days from <laughs> such rich experiences. But I want to just uh, see if we can unpack a little bit the term women and even men and gender here in that our, you've been talk, saying women are doing this, women are doing that, but are there certain groups in, say, Syria, mm -hmm. where are there certain groups of women that are more apt to be active than others? Are there men who are working with them, men who are, as well as men who are working against them, and are there any changes that have, that can be measured or seen at all in terms of gender relations coming out of collaboration across the sex lines mm -hmm. uh, in nonviolent activities. Mm -hmm. um, so anecdotally, I can say that, you know, often I would hear stories from Syrian women um, who had led protest activities. Um, and actually one of the pictures, the reason I like this one, is that this is one of the cases where it was a mixed protest, so it was men and women. And you have you have examples where you have women's led protests and it's just women and they're segregated. But then in other cases you had mixed protests and dances. So the you may have dubka dancing, so men just dancing with men, but you would have, you know, also women around them. So it was like it, it varied. But at the beginning I would say it was very mixed in terms of, you know, the the protests, the street protests and demonstrations, very mixed. I mean you did have women leaders at the universities who played key roles and they were alongside men. And I heard enough stories of women who said, you know, they were arrested for doing some protest activity, imprisoned they were in prison for a while, then they were released, and they would come home to their communities, and there would be some social event or even a funeral, and the women would show up, and the men would just start cheering for them. And it's like they had never experienced that before in their lives. So you have these moments, I'm sure, in, in, in any revolution of exhilaration and just like embrace, because everyone's, it's the revolutionary moment, and everyone wants to be seen as, as, as fighting back. But, I mean, I think then, you know, sort of translating that into why women should have positions on the local council of Aleppo, that's sometimes, it's just, it's a stretch. And it's, you know, it, not a stretch. I mean, it, it has to happen, but it's like, you know, keeping up the momentum and making the convincing argument and being able to show men why women's political participation is beneficial for the whole community, for the whole community, including for men. I mean, that case just has to be made, I think, and that that helps. 
Um, and so I don't, I mean, again, the empirics, it's, it's too soon, and I don't know that it exists in any other conflict or revolution in terms of how it affects gender relations, but I would say the more violent and certainly the more extremist the revolution has gotten, um, the <laughs> gender relations, let's say, are very difficult. So women are not able to go out, I mean, certainly not, you're not able to go out without um, head covering in most parts of Syria now, um, you know, in places where women had been able to go through freely. I mean, there were times even in Damascus where, you know, women were able to go through checkpoints in miniskirts um, and they were never suspected because the regime forces assumed all the opposition was conservative Islamists. So some of the most effective couriers and messengers were women going through checkpoints who were not searched and were carrying special things to, you know, activists across. And I think, you know, when men see the roles that women are playing and they're benefiting from the information and they're benefiting from the supplies that changes but what you know what then needs to happen is okay in this next phase in the political phase you know recognizing that this needs to continue and the women's role is just as important in the formal process and the political process as it is in the mobilization um, but I, you know, I don't know, it's probably too soon to say, like, what at the end of the day has the Syrian revolution, has it advanced, you know, will it have advanced women's rights in a future Syria? I don't know. There's a, there's a depressing pattern of women in conflict being created as kind of the exception, mm -hmm. so that they don't necessarily change gender relations because they're seen as somehow, like, honorary men. Like for not right. not changing either perceptions of women or men. Right. Or, well, or there are cases, though. I mean, you're you're familiar where where women use their maternal roles to their advantage. So, I mean, Argentina is the classic case where any type of political protest under the military junta in the late 70s and early 80s was very very hard to do. So you had a group of women who began to just rally around the Plaza de Mayo as mothers demanding the release of their sons, or at least to know the whereabouts of their disappeared sons. And so they played up the role of, of mothers. And so, and I think, so the dual side is, you know, you have honor accorded to mothers in many societies, and women can use that to their advantage. But then the downside is, well, they're able to do what they're doing because they're not significant and who cares what they're doing anyway. You know, but I can say that the women of the disappeared created space and put pressure on that regime in a way that probably no other group ha would have been able to do in that situation by using the mother um, role. In your experience uh, observing trainings, interventions on behalf on the part of the international community and probably working with uh, Syrian organizations. I'm wondering what you've seen has been the most effective way to support activists, women and men. Mm -hmm. um, some of the trainings we've done have included um, trying to influence confidence around um, you know, the fact that we think that they really have a role to play in peace and security decision making, which is often like a very uh, new idea for them. Um, I think we've done trainings on thinking about um, security sector reform, um, also mapping local capacities for peace. Um, and also thinking about uh, envisioning the future of Syria. And um, I struggle as a trainer um, to really create an intervention that is going to be useful to women who are from inside Syria who are experiencing so many things that I would never be able to remotely understand. Um, so I wonder if you can tell me what you've seen that's been effective and how we can maybe be thoughtful about our ongoing um, <coughs> hope to support uh, women who are still inside and of course outside as well. Yeah, so that's a great question. We began to discuss it a little bit before. Um, first of all, as soon as um, the Institute can get a Syrian co-trainer, the sooner you can do that, the better. So that will help in terms of, because there are frames and there are stories that are obvious to you um, and make complete sense, but honestly to Syrian women will not make sense. And like brilliant insights for you will not necessarily be brilliant insights for them. And But if you can have a Syrian who's familiar enough with the training curriculum, who knows the comparative case studies from other places, but can frame it in sort of a Syrian cultural, linguistic, humor context, that's, I think, more effective. So that already would be helpful. And then I think 
and it's like it's a critique of you know um, in general the the trainings that I observed and even my my bureau supported. Um, you know, we we were doing I think some very good initial work just to support activists and groups inside Syria, which had not been done before in a very difficult environment. So this work is always going to be very, very difficult. And, you know, as the security situation inside the country became worse, you know, getting women to be able to come out for trainings became much more difficult. So even if we wanted gender parity in our trainings, it became very, very difficult. So I was saying to Carol, really, there needs to, like, um, there needs to be greater effort amongst people who do trainings to come up with an effective TOT, training of trainer model. People throw out the term TOT all the time and they think in one week they're doing TOT. No, you cannot train trainers in one week. And, um, and how, you know, give me one success story of an effective training of trainers. So you may, if, if organizations are serious about TOT, you may need a little bit more time, so maybe three weeks or a month, vice one week. And I know it's hard, so you have to figure out what that means in practice. But then the follow-up, of course, is the key. And so it's like, what is the role of the training organization in continuing to mentor the women, men, others who go through the training? You know, what is in place to maintain systematic communication with them? And if they have real-time questions, who do they ask? Like, do they know where to go to? So already, like, setting up a platform for peer-to-peer -peer communication would be helpful. A real TOT model. Some sort of mentoring built, built into the training. Fourth, having small grants or seed funding attached to your training. So if women who learn the art of mobilization and the art of leadership and negotiation want to go back and actually do something with that requires a little bit of money, they don't need to spend three months when they go back into Syria figuring out how to get $300. So find a way to attach small grants to what you're doing because the women will feel empowered. And then like, they'll be able to articulate successes. Like we went back with $500 and helped create a local clinic that brought together Drew, Sunni, Alloys, and whatever in our area, and we did it. We created an underground school, you know. So that I think would be sort of helpful. And then getting, as we were saying, somehow it's hard with Syria and sort of the internet access issue. But in other places, how do you use online platforms to support trainings more effectively? So you're not relying exclusively on in-person um, trainings. So those are a few observations. Hi, um, I'm Yael. I'm an intern at the consortium. Um, and I was really curious um, to learn about the role of the media. You were talking previously about how the media usually covers the violent struggle and not the non-violent. And it reminded me of a TED talk that I uh, watched online a couple of months ago about the struggle in Budrus in Palestine. Yeah. And um, I think it was the director there who was talking. Julia? Yeah, exactly. And she was talking about how the media and the international community really needs to focus their attention on nonviolent struggle. And I was wondering, um, apart from the fact that maybe violence looks better in newspapers, what are the reasons for focusing on violence struggle versus mm -hmm. violence? So this comes up all the time. And you know, um, the idea of if it bleeds, it leads. Have you heard this expression? Yeah. yeah. And so there is some truth to that. But I would say it's not the whole picture. What is the news and the media like? The media likes drama. The media likes like cutting edge. The media likes sort of sexy stories. And so actually, while it's true that violence and explosives, it's, you know, seen as, you know, really dramatic and disruptive. And, you know, there is the iconic image of the insurgent with the gun and Che Guevara. So that's part of it, sort of the ideology. But also, I mean, I think it's also up to the movement and the nonviolent activists to be able to interact meaningfully with the media, whether it's mass media, social media, how do you do this? So I actually have a friend who's been in the news business for a long time but cares a lot about nonviolent resistance. 
he has worked with another um, individual who was a former leader in the South African anti-apartheid struggle and now teaches communications at Cardiff University in the UK. And they have together put together a module, a training module in how to engage the media as a nonviolent activist. And some of their, and it's set up as a training, so it has discussion questions. It's going to be perfect for any of the trainings any of us do um, when they launch it, which will happen probably this week or next week. And so, and one of the main messages is, you know, being able to craft your message to the audience and to the media so that it is dramatic what you're doing is very, very important. And having visuals and dramatic nonviolent actions that are as exciting and provocative and often satirical, so funny, as, you know, that can have the same dramatic effect as violence does. Um, and being able to articulate why you're doing what you're doing, I mean, instead of, Often, um, you know, people who are involved in nonviolent movements, they really, when they're in front of a camera, they have a hard time, and we all do, I mean, this is a really hard skill, have a hard time framing why there is like a boycott or a sit-in and how it relates to the profound injustice that the population is facing and why people are doing what they're doing and why people should care about it. You know, and so it's actually incumbent upon oppositionists to learn the skills involved in effectively using the media. So it's part of media culture, I'm with you, but also I think it's weaknesses of, of the activists themselves. So and those skills just need to be developed because, I mean, you hang out with like the Serbs who led the Otpor movement in Serbia, who found a way when the media was not covering, there was no media, to get their message out, to use tactics that were, you know, shot around the world because they were funny, provocative. So they found a way to brand their movement. Branding is another key thing. How do you, you know, get people to see this action as related to a whole series of other actions and as a movement? And so it's like you identify the action with the group, with the cause. And that can be a compelling story for, for journalists, I think. But like anything else, I mean, like civil resistance is a skills-based enterprise. War, armed insurgencies, victory and defeat depends on how skillful you are. Same thing in civil resistance. And engaging with the media is really important in a important space. Uh, Maria, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm more interested in about uh, the personal level. So how has your worldview changed as a US citizen going and working in Syria? And the other question is, what are the learnings from your organization working and with, uh, in, in Syria and those contexts and bringing the local knowledge? I mean, I'm more interested in what your organization has learned not to do as much as, yeah, from the local knowledge that they have, mm -hmm. you have brought on your, this exposure that you have had. Sure, that's great questions. Um, so my views as, as an American, you mean? I mean, on a, on a very, um, and I said this uh, at Fletcher, that um, on a personal level, certainly, and on a professional level, and as someone who spent a lot of my life thinking about and working on nonviolent resistance, to watch Syria unfold and to watch something that began the way that it did as a nonviolent popular uprising against a terrible regime morph into what it has become and to see the revolution hijacked by extremist elements um, has just been, I mean, it's been terrible, but obviously my, any depression I felt or frustration is nothing compared to what Syrians are undergoing. And when you spend a lot of time with Syrians, a lot of time with Syrians, um, and you hear their stories, it's just like, you don't even know how they're able to go on and do what they're able to do. And so it just, so on a personal level, it's been um, difficult, but of course there's such a thing as negative motivation. So having seen and been part of, um, the Syria, I don't even know what to call it, crisis, catastrophe, disaster. Um, having been part of that, it just forces you to think about, okay, what can be done better? We really don't want to see another Syria. And so as an American citizen, I have to think through all the values that people are often fighting for in these causes 
whether it's against a foreign occupation, whether it's against you know an authoritarian regime, whether it's against a corruption, are often values that Americans say and I think deeply believe we stand for as people. So whether it's freedom, whether it's democracy, blah, 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 of course we don't get it right, and of course we do really bad things in our foreign policy often, but there are things we believe in deep down but at the end of the day, the question becomes, okay, so then what can we do as Americans, and not only the U.S. government? I mean, my interest in this, in this idea of external support is what can governments do but non-governmental actors? What can NGOs do? What can philanthropic organizations do? What can private organizations, media do to create space for nonviolent mobilization and nonviolent activism to succeed, especially in the hardest environments? So in terms of like the personal becoming the professional and the political, that's you know what consumes me more than anything now. And your second question was the second is more about the organization and learning. Yeah. What's, how do you think you love that knowledge? Right. So the starting point for civil resistance is do no harm. So as an outside actor engaging and this is more I can speak when I was working at the NGO that was supporting trainings. None of the trainers would ever give strategic or tactical advice to activists. Never. Because you can give advice based on your own circumstances and your experience that can get people killed. And so that's like sort of a no-go. You can help people go through the strategic thought process, like how to think through navigating repression, how to bring minorities into a struggle, you know, how to deal with the Mojabarat apparatus. You can lead people through a process, but giving specific tactical strategy is a bad idea. For outsiders, certainly it's a bad idea. So that's one lesson, you know, an important lesson, I think, for anyone involved in this kind of activity. But also, at the end of the day, nonviolent resistance is determined and driven by the people leading the nonviolent resistance. There is nothing any outsider can do the US government, the United Nations, you know, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, there's nothing anyone can do to push a button, you know, to bring a million people out into the street in the freezing cold in Maidan in Ukraine, you know, you know, to and sustain nonviolent resistance. Success is ultimately at the end of the day determined by the decisions and the mobilization of the people in those struggles. And that has to be at the forefront of our thinking. It's not about us. It will never be about us. But there are small things I think that can be done, like for example, being able to provide small amounts of targeted money to groups that are nascent, meaning they're new, they're nonviolent, but they don't have the wherewithal to print t-shirts and they don't have cell phones or stuff that you need to organize people. There may be things outside actors can do to get them that type of support more quickly. There can be actions targeting repressive regimes, certainly by governments, so freezing the assets of particular regime officials, making it hard for them to travel, spend money, so sanctions, you know, grants, uh, trainings, how do we think through what effective training is to support nonviolent activists and movements? What does effective mentoring mean? I mean, for me, another idea that's consumed me is how do you create like a virtual online platform? I don't even know if it needs to be virtual. Maybe it's an application, an app. How do you create some platform so that activists who are in the midst of a nonviolent struggle but have questions to ask about what do we do? You know, what is the full range of tactics? Like, how do we get people involved? Like, how do we diversify that they can ask these questions in real time to people who have either experience? or who have been through nonviolent struggles themselves. So if something like that existed, that would already be helpful, I think. So, lots of ideas. I mean, that's, um, you start thinking a lot when you're part of what I consider to be failure. Hi, Erin, I'm an intern at the consortium. I wondered if you are seeing a lot of parallels between Geneva and what happened in Bonn for the Afghan transitional government and how no, it's a good question. Um, so Bonn, you had a parallel process that women were part of, but it wasn't, you had two separate 
um, sort of tracks, as I recall. Um, you had the formal talks, and then the women were meetings elsewhere, right? I forget the, what the setup was. And I don't think those parallel tracks ever crossed. Is that right? Um, so I would say in terms of Syria and Geneva, it's very early in the negotiations. And so they've had two rounds. And as far as I know, they haven't called for a third round of negotiations. Um, so who knows if and when that round will happen, negotiations will happen, which doesn't mean anyone should or could, I mean, be sitting on their hands and, like, we'll just wait for it to come together. So I would say, yes, there's a role for American citizens to put pressure on the government um, to insist on women's participation. And trust me, like, when Robert Ford was the ambassador, um, our ambassador to Syria, and he was engaging with the opposition, I mean, it was clearly... His, on his list of talking points. But I would say that that can have an effect and it can be effective, but the more important push has to come from a coherent, coordinated Syrian women's voice. And until they come together around exactly what they want their role to be and what their structure ought to be and how they are reaching inside Syria in order to get women's and other voices, it will be hard for us as outsiders to really put pressure because we need marching orders. And this is where I believe really in the local agency more even than what we do. We can offer advice on, yes, of course women should be involved. And I can tell you one of the lead negotiators on the opposition side in this most recent round of Geneva II, who was actually negotiating humanitarian access to homes, was a woman. It was Rima Flehan. So the opposition had designated you know, a woman to do this. But numbers are much fewer. Um, Numbers matter, but also the quality of the women participating um, also matters. But one thing you hear a lot is like, and this is the confidence issue of, of women in general. They're like, you know, we don't feel qualified to participate in, in lead negotiations. And, and you know, you'll hear from men, well, what is their experience? It's like, what is your experience leading negotiations, <laughs> you know? It's like as if, you know, they somehow have a strategic advantage negotiating because I don't know why. Um, and so part of it is like, you know, is having that compelling story. Of women. I really think it's going to start with them, and this is where the work just has to be to encourage the women to continue to come together along like their own plan of action. And then they need to have a mobilization strategy for like, what are they demanding of Lakhdar Brahimi? Like, what do they want him to do? What do they want, uh, it's no longer Robert Ford, um, sadly. What, they, what would they want the US ambassador to, to say or do specifically? Besides just let's have women at the table. But the initiative I think has to come from, from the women themselves. I don't know, I mean, does anyone disagree with that who works on these issues? If there, are there other um, things that I'm not thinking of? I was just trying to follow the thing that other organizations were organizing in terms of parallel and you know, CDM that was writing and um, several activists claimed, you know, we do have an agenda and we want an immediate ceasefire. They kind of went like XYZ through what they wanted, but they were excluded from what was going on. But having a list of demands that represents maybe 10 women is different from I think, you know, having, being able to demonstrate that you represent a significant number of women and you have a plan and you have an organization. I mean, power is expressed through organization. And so what is the organizational backbone of Code, I mean, Code Pink is international is doing this, right? It's not Syrian women. They had uh, Syrian activists. Uh-huh. Got it. I mean, I think, you know, there's always a role for, in you know, think, Code Pink is famous for their provocative actions and just like shocking people into trying to think differently. I don't know. I, I don't know how folks here think about how effective they are, but um, so that can be helpful in terms of. But I don't think that that action is going to help the Syrian women come together around a structure that's going to work. <laughs> but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, I think you, Carol Cohn. So I, I know this is unfair, but I just want to keep pushing at that one further. So we have, we have a situation where, you know, if you, well, where we understand both a lot of what needs to be done as uh, internal, not something that outsiders can come in and do, 
and we also have a long history of you know general kind of imperial insensitivity about what we do in other countries, whether it's governmental or at the NGO level. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have, at the same time, you know, working on civil resistance, there is a methodology and a skill set and a bunch of things you have to learn. As you said, it's not just, you know, walking out into the street. So, um, and it isn't something that people necessarily just easily invent by themselves. Um, so, and you have, you have talked about a few different relatively small-scale things. You know, small-scale grants, training with follow-up, larger scale, uh, a, um, a platform for real-time feedback um, or questions. But if you had, you know, the entire budget that we spend on arms transfers now internationally, what would you do with it to support the existence of nonviolent transformation? So that's a great one. So like this big question of the militarization of American society and the DOD budget. So the funny thing is I worked at DOD for a time because I think it's actually important to be able to at least navigate, know how to navigate those institutions and speak the language a little bit because you know, then later on you can, when you ask for things, you may get them just because of relationships. But um, I would say in terms of militarization, it's true about the, the, the funding. But I would say the approach would be how do you essentially co-opt DOD money? So I think just protesting the military machine and the military industrial complex, like just like no down with it, there's probably a role for that. But like at the end of the day, co-optation is often more effective. And it's like how do you convince, you know, members of Congress, whatever, that we're not gonna lose jobs. So how do you like instead of disarmament? How do you do transarmament? So how do you get sort of the technologies and the knowledge and know-how that's going into the weapons to support technologies for civil resistance? How do you get the R&D budgets to support, like, you know, Google-based platforms to connect nonviolent activists all around the world to advance peace, justice, whatever? How do you get and encourage greater transfers of interagency funding from DOD to State Department to support this kind of activity, whether it's 1207 funding or whatever? Um, because that can be done as well. Um, in terms of more, I mean, more money is, can often be a very good thing, but more money applied to nonviolent resistance can often be a bad thing. So I'm never a huge fan of just dumping a lot of money in NGOs in any particular environment because all you do is create NGO industries. And so I'm, I'm a fan. I mention the small stuff because it's like small grants to organizations that already have a volunteer base mm -hmm. and can mobilize people can make a big difference. But just pumping money, and you know that our inclination, if we're given a lot of money, will be to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And what will be the main criterion? Burn rate. And, you know, and effectiveness sort of right. goes out the window. So I think there's a way to encourage um, money and funding that focuses on various <laughs> tools to support nonviolent activists and movements. But my approach would be less sort of the down with the military approach and their, you know, whatever. And more like, okay, you guys don't want to send your soldiers into Iraq to, tr to tr get rid of a regime. What if the people around the world can bring about transitions, peaceful transitions? Mm -hmm. Don't you care about that? Mm -hmm. And can you advocate for us, mm -hmm. you know, to put more money in these particular pods? Mm -hmm. And can you, can the military go on the hill with me mm -hmm. to advocate for bringing in, because, you know, the most powerful people in the US are the staffers mm -hmm. who actually write mm -hmm. stuff into legislation. Mm -hmm to advocate for this money going to USIP to do trainings in civic mobilization, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so this, anything is possible, mm -hmm. and it's just like um, having, I guess, just a, a clear focus for what would be the intent of the money, mm -hmm. and building your base of supporters who are in the enemy's camp. Because mm -hmm. often you'll find that you have a huge number of advocates mm -hmm. in the enemy camp. Mm -hmm. Oh. It, I'm, I'm intrigued by trans armament. Uh, that uh -huh. can, you, can you, and and particularly again, given things like you know the number of congressional districts yeah. that are you know big um, weapon systems are built in, what 
where where would trans armament take us? What would be the things that you would be building that would be useful? So there's a lot of thought now, and one interesting thing about being at USIP is they have a peace tech center. Oh. So they're thinking a lot about how old and new technologies can be used to support peace building. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this sort of the civil resistance tech nexus is new. Mm -hmm. So this is one, you know, one thing that I'm working with them on. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea of research in, you know, applications and, you know, secure communications platforms and how to counter surveillance, for example. So mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff from an, from an activist perspective is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's a chess match between these oppositions and, and regimes. Mm -hmm. And regimes learn from the technologies that activists use and vice right. versa. And so it's like how, essentially, so the question becomes, how do you use current R&D and technologies to give the nonviolent activists mm -hmm. a strategic edge? Yeah. And I mean, I'm not enough of a technologist to know all, like, really the answer, but there are enough smart people in that industry mm -hmm. who get a zillion DOD dollars mm -hmm. who could be encouraged to apply their brilliance to think mm -hmm. about how to support nonviolent activism and movements. So this is a conversation that's starting, I mean, at USIP especially and other places, and it's an interesting one, because if you can bring the big tech giants and other firms um, onto your side, essentially, that would be... That would be a starting point, at least. I mean, in terms of Boeing, I mean, Boeing, though, like all these firms have a huge R&D budget to develop research in a whole spectrum of, mm -hmm. of uh, you know, applications. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a question of, you know, what would you want Boeing to do with a million dollars to support, you know, nonviolent activists mm -hmm. and movements? So that's a question that requires thought, but it's not mm -hmm. impossible. These guys just want to make money. Mm -hmm. Right. So anything that can allow them to make money and keep jobs mm -hmm. is okay. And if it can help nonviolent access and movements, all the better. Yeah, but that's there's another good research paper. Are we? Do we have a list of research <laughs> topics that we've been randomly assigning to Fletcher and UMass students <laughs> <laughs> and every other university here? Sorry. I know we're getting close to the end. Yes. But, um, I was really struck by what you said about women, you know, being questioning them their own leadership capacities. Yeah. And thinking back to the. The 70s and 80s, when I was actively involved in the women's movement, um, it's interesting that uh, that is one of the things that that the similar kind of ideas were expressed by many women. And, and moving into universities, there were a lot of women who were there but were new and in a very hostile, patriarchal institution. And one of the things that happened was that the women that were concerned with change got together. And one of the things we did was sort of organize trainings and organize things, chances for ourselves to practice leadership skills. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, is there anything like that happening in Syria where, where women are getting together and saying, listen, <laughs> we can't afford to be sitting around saying, I can't do this, you know, I gotta just learn how to do it and do it. And our people, are the women helping each other? I mean, so that's the second part is actually, are Syrian women helping each other? So this is already a challenge, too. And it has to do with the mistrust and blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, women are, you asked a question about uni unity and cohesion, all this. Like, again, I, lo I think women are very good at building bridges in divided places and bringing communities together. But also, women sometimes don't treat each other well. I don't think I'm sharing any secrets here. <laughs> and so, like, you know... Let's just say I've seen um, a lot of organizations fracture and women will lead and then that woman really doesn't like that one so they'll break apart and form a new organization. And so, you know, overcoming that is always, I think, a first a first step, but like, you know, that's the main point of, of, of these workshops often is to build the confidence and the leadership skills and the communication skills so there you do, you know, achieve a higher level of confidence. But at the end of the day, the workshop is, you know, the little, that's the beginning point. The real work and why I advocate a small grant component is when the women go back in whatever country, Sierra Beyond, you know, they will feel empowered and their leadership will develop when they actually lead something and they actually lead a project or, you know, they help construct something or build something. And that, I think, more than anything, builds confidence. I mean, there's a role for role play. There's a role for all the exercises that we support with, with these trainings. But it, actually doing something is, at the end of the day, what, what matters. And it's like women cutting their teeth in organizing and mobilizing civil rights movement, femi feminist movement. That's what gave them confidence. It wasn't necessarily any book they read or 
don't know, maybe it was a book they read or, you know, a training they went through, but they just did it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, learning from failure is important, which is why, again, Siri is a case. It's like we're three years in, and we were saying, you know, the, the data on nonviolent res resistance and armed resistance uh, shows that nonviolent campaigns generally take about three years to succeed, which seems like a really long time, except that armed campaigns take about eight years or nine years to succeed. So... Anything else? We have time for one last one. Unless you're just so overwhelmed with thinking about it all that you can't ask another question. <laughs> so many papers and theses. Hopefully, they'll come out. Yes. Yeah, really. yes. All right, then. Please join me in thanking our Thank speakers. Thank you all. Once again.